one of my side and the mise en acte. I don't see why you do want one in the interior. Um. This is a rule for turning a downstairs vector into an upstairs vector in SU2. Thus, if we define a downstairs vector, if we represent a vector with a downstairs index as a column vector, Pn, if we were to represent Pn not as conjugate, this conjugate is automatically the other kind of vector. But if we were to use this to define a vector with a single upper index, which we'll represent as a row vector, then that thing would be n minus p. OK? This preserves the proper phase relation between, uh, well, that's just what comes out because the epsilon epsilon two one is minus epsilon one two. Okay. If you want, if you want to define the phases between cascade minus and cascade naught, so that this is a column vector. Okay. And that is the conventional SU2 phase convention, as in every elementary physics text, every elementary quantum mechanics text. Then the row vector is cascade minus, minus cascade naught. And that's why a minus sign appears there. Okay. The thing that transforms like this element of a row vector is minus the cascade naught. And there's a reason for that. If I were to consider, well, I, I, I get tired of writing size. I can't even pronounce them, let alone write them. If, let's go back to PNN. If I consider these as one particle states, OK, and I'm going to make a two particle state that's an isosinglet by dotting together the row vector and the column vector, that minus sign is important because it tells me that isosinglet two particle state is PN minus NP. And that's right. That's the rule for putting two spin one half objects together to make a spin zero object, not with a plus sign. Okay. The spin zero combination is the anti-symmetric combination. It's the spin one that's the symmetric combination. Yes. Um, could you repeat the argument about symmetry that you gave at the end? Well, <clears throat> sure. I said if we have two identical representations, okay, or for example we're taking a single field and we're making quadratic forms out of it. Then we have a right to ask questions about symmetry of the elements of the direct product under exchange of the two things. Okay, so we're considering NM cross NM. For example, we may be considering meson meson scattering where mesons are in the same octet. What is it which which things are we transforming under under the exchange. We change these two objects. Or if you will, it's the Kleptch-Gordon coefficients, which I have not explicitly computed. I will compute them in special cases and I make this trick. I'm going to change of the, uh, of the two identical objects. Okay? Or for a moment I can think of them as different objects that transform the same way, a red, a red pseudoscalar octet and a blue pseudoscalar octet, and I exchange red and blue. OK, just as when I say when I put together two isospin ones, two pi mesons in an S wave, the I equals one combination is forbidden because it's anti-symmetric under the exchange of the two pi mesons. OK? Now, <clears throat> I get a sequence of terms. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Columbia point on your way in. N minus R. 78, Charlie. M minus S, N minus R. Okay, those come from summing pairs of indices. Obviously, the result of exchanging these two things is to exchange R and S. Okay, so the terms with R not equal to S form pairs of objects, different objects, that change places under the exchange operation. 
Therefore, whatever happens later on, we don't have to worry about them. They'll generate identical objects, and we'll just form appropriate sums and differences, or differences and sums, and get both symmetric combinations and anti-symmetric combinations. So R not equal to S, no problem, a trivial. R equals S is, of course, even under the exchange. And then I start have to worry about what happens when I start peeling off pairs of indices, two from one side to put them on the other. When I peel off pairs of indices, I use an epsilon tensor, which is an anti-symmetric object. Therefore, at each stage when I go from um, a salvage company that was over in Amboise to the left there, they've cleaned out from the left. I get n prime minus 1 n prime minus 1, n plus n prime plus 1. And that's, this is going to be symmetric. Here I've used an epsilon, to, or I should say even, to be consistent with my previous notation. This is going to be add under interchange. Oh, I'm sorry. I wrote it wrong. Excuse me. n prime plus n prime minus 2. Okay, I, because I've used an epsilon tensor, and the epsilon tensor is anti-symmetric. For example, let's consider how do I make an 8 out of 2, um, how do I make a 10 out of two 8s? I have one 8 here, AIJ, BKR. Okay, I've taken out the joint traces, but let's forget about that for the moment. And I've multiplied this by epsilon rik to make an object with three lower indices, a 10, which if I've taken out the traces in here, I've proved to you is already symmetric under those three lower indices. This object is obviously anti-symmetric under interchange of a and b because of the epsilon. Oh, OK. okay. And therefore, this is odd, and I do it again. As I may, if I have a large representation, I get even and odd alternating. Is that a satisfactory answer? Yep. I mean, once you learn the rules, you can forget where they come from. We don't have to reduce things this way if you don't want to, but it just tells you what there is in there. It's one, one possible way of doing it, and there's any one way is good as good as any other for finding out what you get at the final stage. Are there other questions? Now, as promised, I'm going to begin, this lecture will begin located in Dunsville, because I have an unredeemed pledge of proving that our arrows are, in fact, complete, are, are all irreducible, or none of, no two of them are equivalent, and are they are, in fact, a complete set of irreducible inequivalent representations. In order to prove this, I will have to uh, steal two general theorems from group theory that you saw the proof of if you took my Physics 251 course. But if you didn't, you can find them in any standard text like Tinkham's book or uh, Wigner's book. And uh, they sh at least the first of them should be obvious to you. Let, um, let G be uh, some Lie group, say, or some compact group. These compact groups we know have a, uh, compact just means a finite volume. Compact groups have a complete and equivalent set of irreducible representations, all finite dimensional, never any need to worry about infinite dimensional ones. And I'll label them dr, where r is uh, some index or perhaps some in multiplet of indices of g, complete set. of an equivalent irreducible reps. And I'll call D0, which I'll focus attention on, as 
one, certainly one complete, one in equivalent irreducible representation, the one dimensional trivial representation of the group. <coughs> if we consider the direct product, of any two representations, <clears throat> and in fact, I'll do it this way, I'll complex conjugate this one. Uh, that's, of course, a representation, therefore is equivalent to a sum of irreducible representations, which I'll write this way, N, R, S, T, <coughs> D, T. That is to say, the representation T occurs, may occur once, twice, 42 times. If I'll write down how many times it occurs by putting the number integer in front, NRST. The theorem is NRS0 equals delta RS. That is to say, the number of times the identity, the trivial representation occurs is once if the dr is the conjugate, if dr is equal to ds, and not at all if the conjugate is, uh, if it's dr is unequal to ds. This is a sense, a fact you all know, it's sometimes called Schur's lemma in field theoretic language. It's the statement that uh, we can make an, if we have a set of fields that transforms according to an irreducible representation of the group, uh, we can make one and only one mass term from the field and this conjugate. And if you foolishly try to make an invariant mass term from a field that transforms one way and the conjugate of a field that transforms the other way, say from an isovector and an isotensor, you couldn't make it at all. There is no invariant. Equivalently, you could consider DS as labeling a set of states on the left of the S matrix, and DR as labeling a set of states on the right of the S matrix. And the statement is there is no invariant S matrix element. They cannot scatter into each other if R and S are different. And there is only one invariant S matrix element if they are transformed the same. So you usually know this theorem. But even if you don't know it, take it for the moment on trust. Because I will exp take it forever on trust or look it up in the book. I'm not going to prove it for you, but I'm going to exploit it. The point about this theorem is that enables us, it has a corollary that gives us a trivial test for irreducibility. Corollary. D of G is irreducible if and only if D bar cross D contains D naught once and only once. Because if I have a reducible representation, then when I multiply it by its conjugate, I'll get a sum of terms of this kind, one for each irreducible component, and I'll obtain as many d naughts as there are irreducible components. Thus, all I have to do to check that my IRs are irreducible is to check how many times a direct product contains the trivial representation of the group of an IR with this conjugate? Now, since of course I don't know the IRs are irreducible at this stage in my investigation, the first thing I have to find out is how many times each IR contains D naught. If I'm lucky, of course, the answer will be only 0, 0 contains D naught. I haven't proved that yet, so I've got to prove it. So the first step is which IRs contain D naught. That is to say, which ones contain an object that is completely invariant under all group representations. Well, the first thing is, if it contains an object that is completely invariant under all group represent transformations, in particular, it must have zero isospin and zero hypercharge. Now, we happen to have a handy algorithm, because isospin and hypercharge is a subgroup of our group. 
We happen to have a handy algorithm for determining the isospin hypercharge content of any repre IR. And from that algorithm, it's clear that only NN is a possibility. Because you remember, if you have different Ns and different Ms, when the isospin adds up to 0 in that little block I drew for you, the hypercharge will not. And when the hypercharge adds up to 0, the isospins will be different. So you're stuck. So we've only got to look at NN. And NN contains only one thing with I equals 0, Y equals 0. For example, if we look at 1, 1, the object with isospin 0 and hypercharge 0 is the 3, 3 component of the tensor. That's obvious. Isospin and hypercharge act only on the 1 and 2 indices. Likewise, if I looked at 2, 2, it would be 3, 3, 3, 3 component of the tensor, which was the unchanged component. Now, can this object be, in fact, invariant under all group operations? No, obviously not. Because SU3 contains, in particular, a transformation that switches the third basis vector with the second. So therefore, I could turn, by a group operation, A33 into A22. So that's not invariant. The only possibility is, of course, 0, 0, which really does manifestly contain only a single object with nothing changes, a scalar. So the answer is only 0, 0. That comes just from using our isospin algorithm. See, the algorithm is not only useful for computing things, it's useful for proving general theorems. Therefore, to cut check for irreducibility, we have only to compute how many times a given representation times its conjugate contains 0, 0. If we know how many times it contains 0, 0, we'll know how many times it contains d naught, and then we'll know whether or not it's irreducible. So when can which is of course equal to MN or how many times I should say it certainly does it at least once. investigate with our algorithm, because we know we can count and see what happens. Now let's begin at the end. That is to say, we want 0, 0 to come out that are at the end. Okay. <clears throat> what can 0, 0 come from? Well, the only thing 0, 0 can possibly come from in our four index symbols is 0, 0, semicolon, 0, 0. Because from the algorithm for reducing the four index symbols, we always take two off one and add one to the other. Two off one and add one to the other. Well, you're never going to get zeros by adding ones to some positive number. The only way you're going to get zeros is from zero, 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 zero. How many times does zero, 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 zero can occur in MN cross MN? Once and only once. When I take n indices, m indices off of here and here, and n indices off of here and here. Answer, once. <laughs> Thus, <clears throat> we have proved irreducibility. See, group theory isn't that hard if you know how to do things. <laughs> Once you know everything useful about them, you also know everything mathematical interest about them. <laughs> Any questions? Yes? When you said which IR contains D, D is zero. Yeah, uh, we, hadn't proved, we hadn't proved that they were irreducible yet. Oh, oh, okay. So one of them might be a, a, subject, a direct sum of 17 irreducible representations, one of which has to, could be D naught. I had to prove that only 0, 0 contained D naught before I could go through this argument. <laughs> Next stage, inequivalence. 
Well, that's also easy. That comes from this theorem. If I consider n prime m prime bar times nm, that's m prime n prime times nm. And I can ask, how many times does this contain 0, 0? Well, it will contain 0, 0 after the second stage of her algorithm, only if it contains four zeros after the first stage of the algorithm. It can contain four zeros. The only way it contain four zeros after the first stage of the algorithm, since we subtract equal numbers of indices from here and here, an equal number of indices from here and here, and stop when we reach a zero. Right? If I do things by taking a pair one and by one off here and one by one off here, the only way I'll possibly reach four zeros is if this number is the same as this number and this number is the same as this number. Thus, Fermat is equivalent to m prime n prime only if m equals m prime, n equals n prime. Because if two of them were secretly equivalent, like 4, 1, and uh, what were those pairs? 4, 1, and 3, 2, or whatever, that both had 15-dimensional representation. No, 4, 0, and 3, 1. They were a possible sticking point. They were both 15-dimensional. Maybe they were secretly equivalent. Uh-uh, isn't so. They're inequivalent. They're different. <laughs> Any questions on this proof? Uh, yeah. <coughs> what, the corollary? Uh, no, the, the theorem. Yeah, these are a complete set of inequivalent representations. So you're saying if they were equivalent, if they were equivalent, this would be 1. OK, it ain't 1, it's 0. Therefore, they are inequivalent. <laughs> The third, the third step is to show, so we've got them, we've got a set of representations that are guaranteed to be inequivalent and guaranteed to be irreducible. The question is, are they all? Okay. We know that when we did our trick for SU2, we got all of them. On the other hand, if we had done the same tensor tricks for SO3, we would have missed the spin one half representations. Okay. So do we got all of them? Okay, or do we are we missing some someplace? Okay, I'll now have to steal another theorem from group theory. I will erase this theorem, which has now served its purpose and can't be forgotten by everyone except someone who wants to reconstruct this proof. Theorem. This is the so-called orthogonality theorem. Let G be a compact group, same as before, dr as before. There is a way of integrating over the group called integration dg. You put coordinates on the group, and you have a little Jacobian determinant there. You integrate over the whole group. So the dr star of g ij ds kl of g equals 0 if r is not equal to s. In fact, you also know what it is when r equals s, but I don't need that for the theorem. You are probably also familiar with this. It's a statement that for uh, uh, U1, or SO2, equivalently, for example, where the irreducible representations are all one-dimensional, and e to the i and theta, that integral d theta, e to the i r theta, e to the minus i s theta, is 0 if r is not equal to s. 
It happens to be true in general. Now, I will use this theorem in the following way. Let me start out with the three-dimensional representation. Okay? That representation, D10, of G, IJ, I'll call, I'll just consider all of its matrix elements together and consider them, call them Y alpha of G, where alpha is, goes from 1 to 9. Just a set of nine functions on the group, the nine matrix elements of the 3 by 3 matrix. Likewise, of course, D01, IJ of G, is the conjugate objects. Now certainly from Y, if we know the Y alphas, or if we know, in particular if we know both the Y alphas and the Y alpha bars, we know what the group element is. The group is labeled by, is defined by a 3 by 3 representation. So we can certainly find some subset of the Y alphas and the Y alpha bars, some combinations. That's a set of real coordinates on the group just like coordinates on ordinary four space. You tell me those numbers, I'll tell you just where you are in the group. As they stand, they're undoubtedly overcomplete. But to hell with that, I don't care. There's certainly a complete set hiding, lurking somewhere within them. Now, when I take the direct products of two representations, the direct products of this and this and this and this and this and this, I, of course, get matrix elements that are simply the products of the matrix elements, the ordinary numerical products of the matrix elements, the original representation. So direct products have matrix elements. That are polynomials. in these objects. In fact, monomials. <laughs> now, let us now prove that we have all the representations of SU3. Let us assume that there is some representation called D question mark of G, which we have missed. Assume, this be proof by contradiction, assume D question mark of G is not in our list. Okay, possibility. D question mark is some irreducible representation that's not in our list, and therefore by the orthogonality theorem, it's orthogonal. Its matrix elements are orthogonal to those of all the representations in our list. Since in particular all the representations in our list contain everything that can be made out of direct products, it is orthogonal to every polynomial in the Y alphas and the Y alpha bars. Polynomial, I'll conjugate it. because it's not in our list, and therefore it's got to be orthogonal. <laughs> now, a well-known theorem of Weierstrass, given a complete set of coordinates on any space, anything that's orthogonal to all the polynomials in the coordinates is zero. That is the description of the function which is orthogonal to all polynomials. <laughs> That is it. That is the unique function that's orthogonal to all polynomials. But this can't be a representation because in particular a representation must be equal to 1 when g equals the identity element. Reductio ad absurdum. <laughs> Proof of the theorem. 
end of the mathematics part of the lecture. Yes, sorry it was my conscience that made me do it. <laughs> uh, it seems that the, the, the D question mark would be additional um, additional variable in the space and polynomial over the y-alphas would not be. But we know the y-alphas are a complete set of coordinates in the group. I mean, if you give me the y-alphas and their conjugates, those 18 real numbers, I know what the group element is because the group element is a three by three unitary matrix and the y-alphas are just all of its entries. <laughs> okay. Very nice way of proving things. Prob practically the only trick in these lectures that has not been stolen from Herman Weil, stolen from Claude Chevalli, but otherwise it's the <laughs> Chevalli, presume. Okay, so that takes care of the mathematics. If you didn't follow it, don't worry. I mean, it's pretty, it's fun, you'll understand things deep, more deeply, but not particularly things about quantum field theory, if you understand these arguments. Suffice it to say that I taught to make myself an honest man, I have explicitly proved to you that our IRs are indeed what I have been acting throughout this week as if they were. They are a complete set, an equivalent set of irreducible representation. Now we'll turn to applications. I will begin with those applications that involve electromagnetic properties. That is to say, I will totally neglect the medium. I, I should get back. You recall two lectures ago, we derived all sorts of electromagnetic relations between form factors and magnetic moments and things, assuming. Uh, SU2 was perfect and treating electromagnetism only the lowest order. Now I will do the same thing. I will totally neglect the effects of the medium strong interactions, assume SU3 is perfect. It's a bigger group, we should get more relations. Maybe something a little bit more useful than that relation that connected the magnetic moment of the sigma plus to that of the sigma minus. Okay, something that we can actually measure. So the first thing I'll look at will be electromagnetic, form, electromagnetic formulas in the limit of perfect SU3. Or if you want, going to all orders in the medium strong interactions, first order in electromagnetism, and zeroth order in the cross terms between electromagnetism and the medium strong interaction. <laughs> electromagnetic formulas, assuming perfect SU3, we expect to make I remind you, errors on the order of 10 to 20 percent by assuming SU3 is perfect. After all, that is the, the, the if in the particular case of the baryon octet, the uh, individual baryons lie only within 20 percent or so, 15 or 20 percent of the mean mass of the octet. So that's what we've got to live with unless we've got a complete dynamical theory of SU3 symmetry breakdown and can take care of the medium strong interactions by doing Feynman diagrams. Um, now, you will recall that in our isospin analysis, uh, the key point was that the electromagnetic current was one of the generators of the group. Uh, it was, of course, one of the generators of the group. It was one of the symmetries of the strong interactions. And therefore, the electromagnetic current, by the minimal coupling trans prescription, uh, transformed like the generators of the group. That is to say, like isospin and hypercharge, like an isovector and an isosinglet. Now, we don't even know yet how the generators of SU3 transform under the action of SU3. And therefore, we'll have to calculate that first and see what do they transform like. Are they 3, 0, 1, 1, whatever, before we can start applying the same techniques. So there's going to be a digression, or a rather preliminary work, on working out the generators. Let me just remind you about how you deduce the isospin or angular momentum transformation properties under the action of the rotation group. I think well, you, you, have in with you have a Hilbert space in which you've got your quantum mechanical theory. You've got isospin. You've got 
a unitary operator associated with the rotation r, and the rule is ri. This is a three vector composed of operators. This is a unitary operator in the Hilbert space. This is a unitary operator in the Hilbert space. This is a three dimensional rotation matrix acting on that three vector of operators. That's the statement that the three generators of isospin transform like a vector. You all had it in elementary quantum mechanics, but let me remind you how this uh, you know, works out, why they come out being like a vector. If we have an infinitesimal rotation, that's labeled by an axis, E, and an infinitesimal angle, delta theta. It's close to the identity, and it goes along some axis by an infinitesimal angle. The corresponding U, not for this finite R, but for this infinitesimal R, is 1 plus a small amount. And by definition, that small amount is, must be a linear function of these things, since we're only going to first order in theta. And that's the primary definition of I. That is to say, I is a vector because it's dotted into E, which is a vector, E delta theta. And E delta theta is what labels the rotation. <clears throat> Very shortly, I will go through the same analysis for SU3. I'll see how we'll label an infinitesimal SU3 transformation. And then we'll know how the generators of SU3 must transform by the same reasoning. Now, before I do that, though, I want to make a remark to know that will be needed later about how we can represent the isospin generators as a, a matrix. Because after all, a three-dimensional rotation group is the same, at least the same locally, as a two-dimensional unitary group. And we know isospin generators transform like the three pions. And we went through considerable labor to find labor to find out how to put the three pions, as a, write them as a two-by-two two traceless matrix. So let's see how that is for the isospins. For the pions, you recall the answer was phi 0 over root 2, phi plus, phi minus, minus phi 0 over root 2. Those were the three pions represented as a traceless matrix. Now, <clears throat> for later purposes, I will factor out the root 2. I'll still get, of course, something that transforms right. I'll change my scale by multiplying everything by root 2. Now, from this, you can read off the 2 by 2 matrix that corresponds to the three isospin generators. I'll write it down. You'll think I've made a number of algebraic errors, and then I'll explain why it's the right answer. I th Iz, I minus, I plus, minus Iz. Now, there you think, naively, I've made two algebraic errors. I've, messed, I've transposed the plus and minus, and I've left out the square root of 2. In fact, I've done neither. I plus is conventionally defined as Rx plus Iiy, and likewise for I minus, whereupon the charged pion fields are defined with the square root of 2 in the denominator. Therefore, I plus I's plus or minus are what corresponds to phi plus or minus times root 2, not what corresponds to phi plus or minus. That's where the root 2 went to. Secondly, why is I minus up here and phi minus down here? Because phi plus is the field that annihilates phi positively charged pions. That is to say, lowers the isospin. And I minus is the operator that lowers the isospin. <laughs> I'm sorry, minus and plus are used in different ways when defining isospin raising and all lowering operators and charged pion fields. That's the way life is, unless we're going to rewrite all the physics books. We're going to have to live with that convention clash. <laughs> so that's why the minus and plus have changed places and why the square root of 2 has disappeared. Any questions about that? Yes? Um, I, you said that the, the I minus lowered the raising. Just I minus lowers it. I minus is the isospin lowering operator. I because phi plus is the isospin lowering field. 
because it annihilates a phi plus, a pi plus, <laughs> which has positive isospin, okay? Positive i sub z. Sorry about that. This is the way, I mean, I've got to live with it. I can't rewrite all the physics history. <laughs> Okay, we'll just keep that in the sideboard and now try, I wanted that there, and now try and work out the generators of SU3. Our first task, an SU3 matrix is character, we write G, it obeys two equations, G, G adjoint equals one, determinant G equals uh, one. That's the U and that's the S. We want to consider an infinitesimal SU3 transformation. That's okay, you're going to come in or you're going to dump it? The form, G equals 1. Okay, well, you're coming in there, right? Some 3 by 3 matrix times the infinitesimal parameter, which in honor of the left-hand board I will call delta theta. <coughs> GG adjoint equals 1 equals 1 25 Donald plus I epsilon of oh, minus I epsilon delta Don, you want to pick up 4 plus I epsilon right. delta theta and of course delta theta is infinitesimal so we don't write down the delta theta squared terms from this equation it follows right on equals epsilon adjoint that is to say, epsilon is a 3 by 3 Hermitian matrix. We have not let, looked at the trace, at the determinant condition. I let the game get away. At the determinant can be most easily computed if we diagonalize epsilon. In a framework, yeah. epsilon is diagonal. G is 1 minus I epsilon 1 delta theta. 1 minus i epsilon 2 delta theta, 1 minus i epsilon 3 delta theta, with zeros everywhere else. This is an easy matrix to compute the determinant of. You just have the products on the diagonals, and you ignore the terms of order delta theta squared. So determinant g equals 1 minus i delta theta, Epsilon 1 plus Epsilon 2 plus Epsilon 3. Or 1 minus I delta theta trace Epsilon. The last form writes it in a way that is frame independent. The fact that I have computed it in a frame, computed the determinant in the coordinate basis in which Epsilon is diagonal is now irrelevant since the trace is independent of what coordinate basis I use. And therefore, I have the equation, since determinant g is always supposed to be equal to 1, trace epsilon equals 0. Thus, an, infinite, an infinitesimal rotation is characterized by a vector. An infinitesimal isospin rotation is characterized, an infinitesimal SU3 transformation is characterized by a traceless 3 by 3 Hermitian matrix. Yes? It's an infinitesimal quantity that tells you how much of an isospin or a hypercharge. Yes, yeah, a number. Uh -huh. Epsilon is a matrix. Do you want me to put, put little arrows underneath things for what's a matrix and what's not? That's a matrix, that's a matrix, that's a matrix, that's a matrix. Okay. Yeah. Um, but that just tells you how much of an SU3 transformation in any given direction you're going to make. Just a little bit delta theta. <laughs> well, why do you need one phase three generator of SU3? That's what I wanted to the end. Hmm? Why do you need well, I would. But just as here, I need one theta for each angle, but I sum them all up and I get a I need There's a theta one, theta two, theta three in rotations, but they have some fixed ratio for any given infinitesimal rotation. I sum that up into the cosines of the E. Oh, okay. Now, by the same reasoning as for SU2, equivalently O3, which I will not go through explicitly, therefore, since this is a traceless 3 by 3 matrix, So 
to be eight. Use infinitesimally close. Then u of g is one minus uh, sixty-one. Some linear function of the epsilons, which can always be written as trace capital G epsilon times delta theta, parallel to this equation here. And again, for those who are nervous, this is a matrix. This is the identity operator in Hilbert space. This is a matrix made up of operators, just like I is a matrix as a vector made up of operators, and epsilon is a matrix. <coughs> G is, of course, the most general linear function on a 3 by 3 traceless matrix, is a trace with another 3 by 3 traceless Hermitian matrix. So G is Hermitian, and trace G is 0. I mean, it's not defined. The trace of G isn't defined, since if G had something proportional to the identity, it would vanish when I traced it with epsilon. Just as from this, we deduce that I transforms like a vector. So we deduce here that G is a 3 by 3 matrix of operators that transforms like an octet. To wit, if I have some other thing, U of G prime, capital G, U of G prime, adjoint, this is G prime G, G prime adjoint, where G prime is some element of SU3. This equation is exactly the same in structure as this equation here. In the center of the left-hand side, we have a 3 by 3 matrix of operators. Here we have some unitary transformation that implements SU3 on some Hilbert space. Here we have its adjoint. Here we have a 3 by 3 matrix a three by, of numbers, a 3 by 3 matrix of operators, and a 3 by 3 matrix of numbers. <coughs> now let's try and figure out what capital G is. That's going to be very important to us later. Over here, in this two by two block where the pion sat, in our, when we were writing down the pseudoscalar octet, of course, the isospin generators must sit, because those are the things that transform like an isovector, just like the pions. So I've got iz, i minus, sorry, I should leave some space i minus i plus iz. Then just on the diagonal, where I would formally have the eta in the pseudoscalar mesons, I must have the uh, isosinglet symmetry generator, which is, of course, the hypercharge, perhaps with some multiplicative constant that I'll have to work out, because I don't know how the normalization of my standard normalization of the hypercharge connects with I sub, with the SU3. Minus IZ. Yes, minus IZ here, and plus, plus, and minus, I guess, is how I wrote it. Let me just check to make sure I didn't, I won't be later stealing equations that are false. Yes, plus, plus, and minus, where alpha is something I'll have to determine. Now, over here, I'll have some generators. Excuse me, this is badly written. I'll do a quick cosmetic job on the equation. Now, over here in these entries, I'll have some generators that transform like the kaons that are strangeness changing, hypercharge changing generators. I'll just put x's there because I won't study them in subsequent parts of this lecture. They are very important in weak interaction theory where they also have all sorts of names like lambda 5 and lambda 6, again because of dumb notational conventions. But I will just call them, put x's there to indicate that's a part of the matrix I'm not interested in at the moment. Now let's check our normalization that we've normalized these things right by looking at the 3 by 3 defining representation of the group. After all, this is a matrix of generators for any subspace. In particular, it should be true for the one quark subspace. Let's check I sub z. For I sub z, the epsilon that corresponds to an infinitesimal I sub z rotation is 1 half minus 1 half and 0.
That is what an infinitesimal I sub z transformation does in the defining representation. Trace g epsilon is very easy to compute. Only the diagonal entries compute. This cancels against this. You only have I sub z. Jolly good. Works out. OK, I didn't make some dumb normalization mistake. Now let's choose, figure out what alpha is. For y rotations, infinitesimal rotations in the y direction, epsilon is 1 third, 1 third, minus 2 thirds, 0 everywhere else. Trace epsilon g is therefore 1 third times 2 alpha times y from the first two diagonal entries minus 2 times 2 alpha, no, sorry, plus 2, the two minus signs cancel, times y from the third entry. Equals 2 alpha y. But I want it to be y. I want the generator of an infinitesimal hypercharge rotation to be the hypercharge and not 17 times the hypercharge. So therefore, I deduce alpha equals 1 half. I will thus rewrite this matrix because we're going to look at it continually. Y over 2. Oh, oops, sorry. Minus I sub C plus Y over 2 <laughs> minus Y. It will also be interesting for our electromagnetic purposes to find the epsilon that corresponds to a Q rotation. Q is I sub Z plus Y over 2. When you write up a slip on it, associated with that is, of course, the corresponding sum of the epsilons we have on the board. And that is, by an elementary computation, 2 thirds minus 1 third minus 1 third. Those are the charges of the three fourths. We're going to be studying electromagnetism in a moment. Finally, since I'm going to do a problem involving the study of the baryon octet, in fact, I'm going to do round seven of them in fast sequence. Uh, not seven, actually, three. I'll uh, write down the famous baryon octet. And you can all sleep while I work it out. Uh, let's see. Uh, minus of a plus sigma naught over root two. two to seven minus six. Sigma plus proton sigma minus. 602 to 72, Tony. Minus sigma naught over root 2 plus lambda over root 6. Neutron, sorry, off right, right great start, cascade minus, minus cascade naught, minus square root of lambda. Ho hum. That was from the end of last lecture. Now, we are now have all the machinery here. We have the epsilon matrix that corresponds to the electric charge. We have the um, we have the um, uh, baryon matrix, and we have the matrix of generators, which actually I won't need in this particular form for 20 minutes. Now, first thing we're going to study is electromagnetic form factors. Of course, aside from the neutron and proton, the only electromagnetic form factors of the hyperons, the other baryons that have been measured, are the magnetic form factors, and those for only a few. Of course, also F1 of 0, which is measuring the charge. <laughs> there are um, how many electro, if I consider, let me consider the matrix element, all space and spin indices suppressed between some baryon state B prime of a general current in the octet. I'll put an underline in there. That's an octet of currents, a matrix made out up of currents, just like this generator matrix, B. Arbitrary initial baryon, arbitrary final baryon. 
These currents will come into all sorts of places. You know, you might want to look at the hypercharge form factor or the isospin form factor. They might be different. You might want to look at some of these strangeness changing things. Those turn out to be currents that play an important role in interaction theory, although they're not the only currents. But actually, our ultimate thing will be uh, the electromagnetic current, and therefore, that's what we're interested in at the moment. And therefore, what we'll be particularly interested in is the choice of this thing with epsilon, where that's this epsilon up here, the electromagnetic one, and that'll pick out the electromagnetic current. However, apart from dependence on space and spin variables, that is apart from the functions f1 and f2, if for a general octet current made out of two matrix elements between two octet baryons, how many independent matrix elements are there? Well, this is a question of, out of an 8 and an 8, how many 8s can we make? Well, we know that. 8 cross 8 is 1 plus 8 plus 8 <coughs> plus 10 plus 10 bar plus 27. Thus, we can make two eights. Here they are. Thus, this general matrix element for any baryon on the right, any baryon on the left, and any member of the octet, any epsilon, is given in terms of just two quantities, neglecting space and spin dependence, two F1s and two F2s. In particular, this means that if we know in the limit, idealized limit of perfect SU3 symmetry, if we know the electromagnetic form factors of the proton and the neutron, for example, F1 and F2 for the proton and the neutron, then we know F1 and F2 for every baryon. And furthermore, we know the matrix elements of the strangeness changing currents and the hypercharged currents and any other linear combination you want. <laughs> Indeed, it's very easy. To write, and when we know there are two, it's exactly like meson nucleon coupling, you see, an octet coupled to two octets. We can write the most general form. There'll be some coefficient, I'll call it alpha, I'm fond of Greek letters today. Trace B bar prime, the three by three matrix corresponding to the outgoing baryon. Epsilon B, I won't even bother to write as commutator and anti-commutator, plus beta trace b bar prime, b epsilon. You tell me what b and b prime you're interested in computing the matrix element between, what current your epsilon is. Alpha and beta are, of course, actually functions of space and spin. They're f1 of p squared and f2 of p squared with all sorts of spinner factors, q squared, sorry. But if I'm looking, for example, at the magnetic moments only, they're just numbers. And I'll tell you what the magnetic moment of everything is. Now, I'm shortly going to evaluate this formula for the specific case of interest, the electromagnetic current matrix elements. But before I do that, are there any questions about what the operation so far? The Bs are three by three matrix that represent the final and initial baryons. For example, if it is a proton and a proton, then B has got a one in this entry and a bunch of zeros everywhere else, and B prime has also and then you take his adjoint, that's the bar. B is the initial state, B prime is the final state, labeled by three by three SU3 matrices for the same reason they're labeled by four by one Dirac spinners. Well, I'll do everything. I mean, I'll do all the magnetic moments. Epsilon, in the particular case of electromagnetism, is written up here. Oh. If, on the other hand, I were interested in the hypercharge form factor, epsilon would be this matrix here. If I were interested in the I sub Z formula form factor, epsilon would be this matrix here. If I were interested in one of the strangeness changing currents, it would be something with ones in this X entry. Yes? Yes, that is a consequence of minimal coupling, as stated two lectures ago, and it goes through for SU3 just as well as it does for isospin. And that's why you asked what an 8 plus 8 is. That's right, because, well, I can look at it several ways. 
I can say this is an 8, and an 8 operator is acting on it. And therefore, it's 8 cross 8, and it's got to go into an 8 state. You can't do that if it's in a 27-put combination. Other questions? People are asking questions who don't usually ask questions, which lead me to believe I've been, I mean, I have no objections to running over time. So, you know, ask questions if you don't follow. It's good. <laughs> yes? Well, that's the, how it, epsilon is what is the infinitesimal transformation in the defining representation of SU3, the 3 by 3 one. We know what an infinitesimal I sub Z transformation is in the 3 by 3 representation. It multiplies the up quark by 1 half, it's I sub Z, the down quark by minus 1 half, and the singlet quark by 0. We know what it is for hypercharge. And therefore, we could compute the charge of the quarks, but it suffices to um, just add them together using this formula. Actually, I think I'll call this 3 alpha and this 3 beta, so I don't have to worry about the 1 third <laughs> the definitions. Now, there are, in fact, how many observable, in principle, form factors are there, are uh, magnetic moments? Well, of course, there are eight baryons, and they can all have an electromagnetic, even the limit of perfect SU3 symmetry, they could have magnetic moments between them. So that gives us eight objects. And there's one possible cross term. Uh, the uh, selection rules for, uh, already given by isospin and charge conjugation would allow a sigma naught lambda cross term. There's absolutely no reason why the electromagnetic current should not have a matrix element between sigma naught and lambda. In fact, that matrix element is there, and it is responsible. It had better be there, because the principal decay mode of the sigma naught is sigma naught goes into lambda plus gamma. And it goes lickety-split. Lickety-split means that even after studying this decay for 20 years, all that we have is an upper bound for the uh, uh, decay uh, for the lifetime. <laughs> and uh, that means that uh, there is better be a lowest as low order in electromagnetism as it can be to its first. <laughs> and therefore, there had better be an electromagnetic current matrix element. So in fact, there are nine observable quantities one could measure, the nine magnetic moments of the, uh, as the eight magnetic moments of the baryons. And this transition matrix element, which is, of course, in the limit of pure SU3 symmetry, F2 dominated, since F1 between sigma naught and lambda vanishes. And a kind of, that's the charge operator, matrix element of the charge operator. So in principle, and indeed in the literature, you will find all nine of these things computed in terms of the magnetic moments of the proton and the neutron. But I am going to be... Um, somewhat uh, less ambitious, and just compute the ones that I can find in the Rosenfeld tables for you. And if you want to compute the others and make prophecies about future Rosenfeld tables, you are encouraged to do so. What is in the Rosenfeld table with anything except the ludicrous error bar the Rosenfeld table is the, sorry, Rosenfeld was the founder. It is now the, the Lawrence Radiation Lab slash CERN book. <laughs> it now fits into your pocket if you have pants with big pockets. <laughs> we expect in another 20 years it will resemble the uh, handbook of, uh, of uh, chemistry and physics. <laughs> but at the moment, it just has five baryon magnetic moments in it with anything aside from ludicrous errors, and even the errors on these, except for the proton and neutron, are not. So these are proton, neutron, sigma plus, lambda, and cascade minus. Our formula on the board, by just plugging in the appropriate matrices and epsilon, enables us to deduce these things in terms of two parameters, alpha and beta. I can then solve for alpha and beta in terms of the proton and neutron moments and predict the three other measured moments. Okay. Now, first case, I'll stick in the proton. The important thing to remember is when you're multiplying by a diagonal matrix, life is very simple. 
If you multiply it on the left, Every, every column gets multiplied by the diagonal entry. If you multiply it on the right, every row gets multiplied by the diagonal entry. So firstly, the proton from the alpha, three alpha term. That gives me a two here times the proton, which is up here in the first row. So I get two alpha. Then from the beta term, I'd have a minus one because the proton is in, sorry, it's in, the first row. It's in the third column, so I get minus 1 times beta. That's what I have if I put B, the proton matrix, B bar prime, the proton matrix, and epsilon, the epsilon displayed. Now, next, the neutron. That's in the third column, just like the proton, and it's in the second row, so that gives me minus alpha. Sigma plus is in the first row, just like the proton, and in the second column. But the second entry of epsilon is the same as the third. So we have our first prediction right away. The magnetic moment of the sigma plus has got to equal the magnetic moment of the proton. Lambda. Now we've got to be a little trickier because of the roots uh, all of those ugly root sixes and so on. This is the first row and the first column. So that gives me two alpha uh, plus two beta from being the first row and the first column. But now when I square it from that entry, I just get one sixth. From the second row and column, I got minus alpha plus beta times one sixth. From the third row and column, I get minus alpha plus beta times two-thirds. A little elementary algebra informs you that this is um, minus one-half alpha plus beta. So we now have our second prediction. I better put our predictions summed up here. I'll then compare them with experiment. Magnetic moment of the sigma plus is equal to the magnetic moment of the proton. Magnetic moment of the uh, lambda is equal to half the magnetic moment of the neutron. Not only the magnetic moment, of course, F2 at k squared equals 436, but that doesn't happen to be measured. <laughs> Any electromagnetic matrix element, F2 plus 37 F1 at k squared equals 436. Finally, the cascade minus. That's in the third column, so that is minus alpha. And the first, third row, excuse me, I always get my rows and columns mixed up, plus 2 beta. And this is, um, requires a little more algebra, and I'm feeling fatigued, so I'll work it out. It says here, minus mu p plus mu n. And is that right? The sum of these things is plus alpha minus 2 beta. That's right. Hmm? Um, why does the, uh, the lambda have opposite sign? Uh, the lambda over 2 over 6? Oh, that's because this is plus two-thirds minus a third minus a third. Those come from minus theirs. The minus signs in here, oh, that's an error. I'm sorry. The minus signs in here, where they are, just cancel out. They're the same on the right and the left. So that's our third prediction. Mu cascade minus equals minus mu p plus mu n. Now, of course, the proton and neutron moments, since they were first measured by Ravi more than 20 years ago, have been measured to fairly well. And compared to the hyperon moments, they have practically no experimental errors on them. So I will just write down the theoretical answers with no experimental error, because proton and neutron errors are irrelevant. Oh, one remark I should have made. As I said, this could be anything. It could be the total moment. It could be the anomalous moment. It could be any linear combination of the two form factors. Just to check that we haven't made any algebraic errors, 
let's check that things are right if, it's, uh, if it is the F1 at zero, that is to say the charge instead of the moment. That looks right. One equals one, zero equals zero, minus one equals minus one plus zero. Good. <laughs> Always useful to apply these trivial consistency checks. You frequently find you've made a dumb mistake that way. Now, in other words, the, um, this is 2.8. These are measured in nuclear magnetons, that is to say, in units such that of uh, proton mass for the unit of magnetic moment. Uh, should we use the mass of the proton, or should we use the mass of the hyperon? There, after all, is a 20% difference. Who knows? This is a perfect SU3 computation. It would be cheating to make a decision on that. I just use the proton moments, be proton units, because that's what they're expressed in in the table. It's easier. <laughs> the neutron moment is minus uh, 1.9, so this is minus 0.95. And the sum of the two is minus 0.9. Experiment from Rosenfeld. 2.62 plus or minus 0.41. That's embarrassingly good, but the other one takes care of that. <laughs> o minus 0.67 plus or minus 0.6. Minus 1.93 with a huge error, 0.75. I have seen these numbers rise and fall like the Dow Jones average in the last decade. <laughs> you have to be genuinely sophisticated to know the meaning of a standard deviation. Secret wisdom of the theorists, the standard deviation in modern high energy experiment is a unit like the League in medieval Europe. <laughs> a German league represented three and a half times as much as an English league. <laughs> Likewise, there is as vast a difference between a Telegdi standard deviation and a Moglic standard deviation. <laughs> but, uh, uh, in any event, whoops, I'm sorry, yeah. I wrote 0.6, then everyone said, why is that bad? 0 0.06, excuse me. Uh, uh, but as you can see, even if we take the standard deviations dead seriously, which I would not advise you to do, the error, error bars stay narrow, but the number leaps up and down from year to year. <laughs> this is uh, good. <laughs> The only thing if you make it, you can decide if you make a 10 year average is that it's something with a 1% error, but something you only know to within 50%. The, uh, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, come on, they're very hard experiments. They're very hard experiments, really, which is why they, these things happen. These particles do not live very long. You know, it's hard enough. Robbie got the Nobel Prize for measuring it for the proton. So sigma plus is a lot trickier. The, uh, so how did they do it for lambda? Hmm? Uh, precession experiment. Uh, it's, you can tell it's polar. You don't have to polarize it. You can tell how it, it's, uh, it decays very asymmetrically weakly by a fluke into a proton and pi, a nucleon and pion. From the direction of the decay products, you can t it's a large correlation between the spin of the lambda and the direction of the decay product. So you can tell how it's spinning from where it decays. It's also made preferentially in a certain spin state, I believe. So what you do is you make a beam of lambdas, you send them through a magnetic field, you watch them decay, and you measure the precession of the magnetic moment. Not easy. The, um, the, um, The agreement is, of course, jolly good within 20%, even if you take the experimental errors seriously. Is that right, one? Yes, I, it is one. It's within two standard deviations. Come on. <laughs> okay, the other one is even so. I, I, I could have said I didn't. Uh, I didn't, uh, I thought the thing, you know, this is a big error bar, it's 0.75. <coughs> the, um, we can also, 
use uh, SU3 to study second order electromagnetic effects, just as we did for eta decay in SU2. I will give an example of that. I will study the electromagnetic mass differences between the members of the same octet. That is a second order electromagnetic effect, we believe, although nobody can compute it because it diverges. However, since all we're going to get is linear relations between things, we don't care what makes it finite. And in fact, this will offer us not only a jolly way of testing SU3, but a jolly way of testing the idea that the mass difference is purely electromagnetic, since we can't test it by computing the proton and neutron mass differences. Now, as I, first thing we've got to do is count the number of invariants we've got to see if we've got any predictions. The, um, we are the uh, second order of electromagnetic effect, as I demonstrated during my SU2 lecture, transforms like the product of two currents, as far as its internal symmetry properties have to go. So we have to consider the product of two currents. That is to say, 8 times 8, the two currents, since they're both members of an octet. Plus 1, plus 8, plus 8, plus 10, plus 10 bar, plus 27. This is for the product of any two currents, any one current from the octet and any other current from the octet. Of course, we're interested in the case where both currents are the electromagnetic current, or more to the point at the moment, both currents are the same. And that means the antisymmetric combinations cannot appear. So one of these 8s, the 10, and the 10 bar are out by anti-symmetry. Now we come, this is JJ, the product of two currents. Then we have B prime B, the initial and final baryons that have got to be hooked together with this thing in an SU3 invariant way. That's also 8 times 8. And there, of course, there's no particular symmetry or anti-symmetry. We can make an invariant by hooking a 27 to a 27. The 8 up here to either of these 8s, and the singlet to the singlet. The singlet to the singlet is irrelevant. That's a singlet. And it just shifts all the masses by the same amount. It's an electromagnetic mass shift, but it doesn't make an electromagnetic mass difference. Therefore, we have 1, 2, 3 unknown constants. And uh, there are um, four unobserved electromagnetic mass differences, neutron, one within the neutron proton, one within the cascade, and three within the sigmas, uh, two within the sigma, sigma plus, sigma naught, and sigma minus, sigma naught. So the computation is worth doing. With four experimental quantities and three free parameters, we can make one prediction. Now we have to write down the three invariants. Now they will involve epsilon twice because they involve the current twice. So I will just write down three totally randomly selected objects. Alpha uh, B bar prime, ep sorry, trace. Oh, yeah. Alpha trace B bar prime epsilon squared B plus beta trace B bar prime B epsilon squared, that looks different, plus gamma B bar prime epsilon B epsilon. That has the right things. It's linear in B, antilinear in B prime, involves two epsilons for the two currents, and is an SU3 invariant. I could now begin to compute, but it's useful to simplify the matrix algebra by observing that Epsilon is P minus one-third I, where P is the projection operator, one, zero, 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 zero. Thus, epsilon squared is um, P squared minus two-thirds P plus one-ninth I or one-third p plus one-ninth i. 
P I is P. Oh. That's what I makes I I. <laughs> so the uh, the um, therefore we could write this as some linear combination. Of, with some new coefficient I'll call A, trace B bar prime PB plus trace B bar prime BP with another new coefficient I'll call B plus C trace B bar prime PBP plus D times trace B bar prime B from picking up all the ones that come in everywhere. And of course, that's totally irrelevant. That's just a common mass shift. And I just went through this little three minute trick because this is obviously easier to compute this for a matrix that's mainly zeros than for a matrix that's full of one thirds and two thirds. You get the same result by computing this, but it would just be harder algebra. Okay, now I'll write down the, all the things in the, uh, that we're gonna worry about. And I'm also going to run 10 minutes over because I'm going to make a remark after I get this beautiful formula. P, N, thank God we don't have to worry about the lambda with all of its square roots of sixes. Sigma plus, sigma zero, sigma minus, cascade minus, cascade naught. Where we'll let the names of the particles stand for their masses so I do not have to write a bunch of M's all over the board. Firstly, the A term. Multiplying by P on the left just multiplies the first row by uh, one and annihilates all the other rows. So I get an A here from the P, an A for the sigma plus, and a one half A for the sigma naught because of the one over square root of two. The B term. There I've multiplied the first column by one and everything else by naught. So I get one half B for the sigma naught, <clears throat> one half plus just plain B for the sigma minus and plain B for the cascade minus. The C term, I've annihilated everything except the first row and everything except the first column. So all I have is the sigma naught. Now I've got to form linear combinations of the observable differences that um, are independent of A, B, and C, and therefore zero. The difference that is least well measured is cascade minus minus cascade naught, which as we see is pure B. We don't want to introduce the sigma naught, and it's easy to see that this is, I believe, sigma minus minus sigma plus plus proton minus neutron. So proton minus neutron gives me an A, sigma plus minus minus sigma plus gives me B minus A, and that is the desired formula. B is B minus A plus A. Any questions? Yes? Why are you going to touch the left? There's no observable electromagnetic mass difference involving the lambda. My side remark will involve the lambda, but it'll involve it in a different way. I'll get to that in two minutes. There's no lambda what? <laughs> lambda plus lambda minus splitting? <laughs> yes, there is an electromagnetic mass shift of the lambda, but how am I going to measure it? <laughs> how can I tell it from the medium strong effects that split lambda from sigma experimentally? The electromagnetic mass shift between the sigma plus and the sigma minus, I can measure. Okay, experimental numbers in MEV are here somewhere. Good God, is this only page four? Yeah, well, the experimental numbers are, um, no, this is my side remark. Ah, oh, I see, I skipped the side remark. Okay, 6.4.
plus or minus 0.6 equals 7.99 plus or minus 0.8. Ah, actually, I see the sigma difference is a little less well-known. Things have changed since I wrote that paper. And then P minus N is minus 1.29, all in MeV. Or this is equal to 6.7 plus or minus 0.8. Pretty good. <laughs> Any questions? <clears throat> now, I want to said I was going to make a side remark. In fact, someday there will be one other one other um, thing deduced from this, because in fact the electromagnetic correction to the Hamiltonian has an allowed off-diagonal term. It can connect sigma naught and lambda. That is allowed by electromagnetism. Therefore, although I didn't compute it here, I, I mean, then I'm going to tell you there is a small amount of mixing between the sigma naught and the lambda induced by this term. Or equivalently, there is a tiny transition vertex which is, which is computable from this thing, and it's of the order of all these other things, 4 or 5 MeV. Where sigma naught comes in, and something electromagnetic goes on, and a lambda goes out. So there is a correction to this 8 by 8 baryon propagator, just like these on diagonal terms are diagonal. No, it's second order electromagnetism, just like a mass shift. This is not the thing that's analogous to the magnetic moment, which we discussed before. It is the thing that is analogous to the, uh, to the mass shift. Only a virtual photon. Hmm? Well, how can a neutral particle have an electromagnetic mass shift? The same reason. It, it decomposes virtually into charged particles of opposite charge, and they cancel to EMs in ways that have no reason, no way of cancel, no reason to cancel. Okay. These more particles. Well, so they're 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 in the theory. They're all those baryons and mesons. Sigma naught can become a, a sigma plus and a pi minus. The sigma plus and pi minus. The neutron has a magnetic moment. Okay, they're there in the world. Everything goes virtually into everything else. <clears throat> it's a blob with all sorts of things inside. And we don't know what's inside. We don't understand the details of how electromagnetism acts, interacts with the strong interactions. If we did, we could compute the proton-neutron mass difference, which we can't. Okay, but we can explore the hypothesis. I mean, this marvelous agreement of the experiment not only checks SU3, it checks the idea that the mass differences are electromagnetic. Now, how do I measure this? Mm. I mean, it's not easy. It introduces a small amount of mixing of sigma naught and lambda, or equivalently, of course, by time reversal of lambda and sigma naught. So my sigma naughts I see coming out are not pure sigma naughts. They have a tiny admixture of lambdas and vice versa. But that's a hard thing to look for. Some years ago, Richard Dallas made a suggestion which is not inconsistent for measuring this quantity, which is not inconsistent with experiment, but which doesn't give a good check. So I didn't bother to look up the numbers in the literature. The errors are still too bad. And it has to do with something called hypernuclei. Every once in a while when a lambda goes into a bubble chamber or a cloud chamber or a blob of something, it gets, it gets captured by, an, by a proton and forms something like a helium nucleus, except this mess that being made, or a deuteron, except instead of being made out of a proton and a neutron, it's made out of a proton and a lambda. And then, of course, the lambda is unstable, it decays, and you see this thing. You see this hypernucleus exploding. It could also happen with heavy nuclei. So you have some idea, if you know something about nuclear forces, of the nature of the force between the lambda and the proton, or equivalently the neutron, the lambda and the nucleon. Now, because the lambda is an isosinglet, the normal thing that makes a force between protons and, um, 
and uh, lambdas, or nucleons, uh, between protons and neutrons, the pi in exchange can't act because there is no pi lambda lambda vertex by isospin conservation. The, worst, the only thing that can happen, in fact, if you don't take account of electromagnetic effects, Here's a nucleon, proton or neutron, I don't care. Here's a lambda, it becomes a sigma, emits a pi, and becomes a lambda again. That's perfectly allowed, and that gives the force. In fact, it gives the principal force between nucleons and lambdas. And, but of course, it's a force of somewhat longer range, shorter range than normal nuclear force, because instead of exchanging one pi, in, you're exchanging two pi. In. So the range is less than 1 over 4 m pi squared, because that's the lightest thing you can possibly exchange has a mass of 2 m pi, range squared, I should say. However, with this electromagnetic vertex, you can get another process. The lambda comes along. It becomes a sigma naught. Or equivalently, the lambda coming out of your beam is not pure or lambda. It's a mixture of lambda and sigma naught. It's the same story. This force is weak. Sigma naught emits a pi, goes into a lambda, and the pi interacts with the nucleon. You would normally think this would be a very small correction to the lambda-nucleon interactions. And there's, of course, a corresponding diagram where the blob is on the other side, mirror reflection. You would think this would be a very small correction to the lambda-nucleon interactions. But this is, in fact, not so for two reasons. Firstly, this is a longer range force than this. So it can catch lambdas that are just making glancing collisions. It has a range. Secondly, it's not down as small as you might think, because although this blob, which is mass-like, is 5 MeV, because the, just by a fluke, the lambda and sigma are very close together in mass. They only have a 75 MeV difference. The energy denominator, or the propagator on this vertex, is ra has a rather small denominator on the order of 75 MeV, the lambda-sigma mass difference for small momentum transfer exchanges. So therefore, in fact, it's not typically electromagnetic in size, that is down by 1 over 137, but just down by something like 5 over 75, which is around 1 15th, because you have this large energy denominator pushing up the small vertex. Thus, Dahl suggested a decade ago that by a close study of hypernuclei, you should be able to detect this force and estimate its coefficient. And since you know everything in the diagram, this is pi nucleon, this is lambda sigma naught pi, which you already know if you have a theory of this, the, uh, you should be able to define this correction, do this force, deduce the sigma naught lambda mixing matrix element, and uh, therefore uh, deduce um, the um, check get another check of SU3. <coughs> the last time I looked, although someone who knows a lot about hypernuclei may correct me, uh, the last time I looked was a couple of years ago, there, uh, the uh, errors, the thing was right within the order of magnitude, but there was still an error of two or three, even according to most optimistic hypernuclear phenomenologists, so I haven't bothered to look up the new numbers. Um, you won't find that in the data book. <laughs> but uh, uh, nevertheless, in principle, it's a good way of checking things. And someday there'll be enough data in and a good enough understanding of hypernuclei. It's not a high priority subject, but research proceeds. And uh, we'll be able to check even this mixing matrix element. There is another process that runs by a mixing matrix element, where the mixing matrix element is not electromagnetic, but medium strong. But before I begin to discuss that, which I will do at next lecture, 
I will have to discuss the medium strong interactions and the famous Gelmano Kubo formula. And that will be the subject, the beginning of the next lecture. And then we'll go on to talk about some other things. Yes? Just when B is a lambda and B prime is a sigma. No, it comes up from the A's. It comes up from A and B. It's a cross. I'll come up and talk to me privately. 